in production, when we start to talk about distortion, saturation, and excitation, the common question is, well, what's the actual difference between these types of processors? Because it seems like you're using the terms synonymously, or you might say, oh, I'm going with an exciter here, but I want to use a more aggressive form of distortion there. And you know what? The reason that question continues to be asked time and time again is because there isn't a really good definitive technical definition that we can use that won't confuse us. So technically, distortion is a really broad, wide-ranging concept. Any form of saturation is really distortion because you are altering the signal. You're adding something that wasn't there to begin with. But unfortunately, that can then be really confusing when we're trying to talk about and describe the differences between the two processors and when they're appropriate in, say, production and when they're appropriate in the mix stage, which is where we're at now here in this section of the course. For that reason, we're going to really be talking about saturation versus distortion in terms of practical application. So since every saturator can be referred to as distortion, when are we using the settings in more of a saturation context and when are we pushing them over into a distortion context so that's what we're going to be talking about here remember we're not going with the technical definition and some of this is i'll say straight up subjective it's pure opinion on my part but i think it's useful to try and differentiate these processors as much as possible so that you understand the right applications for whatever stage you're at in making music as a mix function, okay, very rarely do you hear people use the word distortion when talking about the processing in a mix, okay? Maybe they'll refer to it as some form of tonal harmonic distortion, but rarely do you hear that word distortion thrown around. You don't go, oh man, I'm going to distort the crap out of these vocals here in a mix. You just don't hear that very often. Normally, the word that we use is saturation and occasionally maybe the word excitation. There's a problem with exciters and excitation that we'll talk about in the actual example here, but that's a word that could be used. However, it could be interpreted in a lot of different ways. So uh, just keep that in mind. So a few major bullet points here that I wanna go over first and foremost is that distortion and saturation are both typically dynamic. There are some exceptions to that rule, but not very many. And this is what I would say is the most important point of this entire presentation. If you're taking notes, this is the thing to highlight and circle. If you're not taking notes, this is the thing to write down. Distortion and saturation are dynamic. What that means is, and we'll go through a couple of examples. Let's say that we have a tube amplifier. Okay, and that tube amplifier has its limits where it can play back signal cleanly. You'll see this. So let's say, for example, and this isn't going to be true to real life, but let's say that it's plus or minus 15 volts. So alternating current, you know, if you imagine the sine wave, you have that baseline, it goes above and below. So plus 15 and minus 15 there on the bottom. So as long as you feed in a signal that is within that range, as long as you're not overdriving it, that amplifier can work to the best of its ability and play back that sound as cleanly as the component has been configured. Okay, so I'm not going to go into whether or not people can hear the difference between like tube versus transistor or solid state based amplifiers. I really don't care. That's not important. But as long as the signal comes in and it's not going over that plus or minus 15 volts, then you have no problem on playback. The second you start to feed a voltage in that is more than plus or minus 15, let's say it's 16 Okay, then some form of distortion and or saturation is going to occur. And when that happens, okay, you cannot go over 15 volts. It cannot go over that ceiling. What that means is a compression or a limiting is going to happen there on that peak when it is crossing over its limit. So that's really the crucial idea. And then that energy is redistributed across the spectrum. It might be harmonic. It might not be. But that's really the main idea. So a compression, a limiting is occurring when we are using and hearing distortion slash saturation. And it is required that you go over the limit 
of that amplifying circuit in order to hear that distortion or saturation. And it doesn't just have to happen with amplifiers. It can happen at other portions uh, along the signal flow as well. But that's usually the general explanation of how distortion or saturation is working. And it is dynamic. Same idea with digital distortion. We have that zero ceiling. If we go above that, we hear digital distortion. And as long as we don't, it plays back the signal cleanly. Now, here's the other big idea. Okay, if, for example, with either a, you know, tube amplifier or digital distortion, if I scream really, really loudly, and you start to hear some of that digital distortion, once I bring my voice back down, and I start to talk quieter again, you'll notice how that goes away. All right, so it's not as if the saturation or distortion is happening all the time, unless you really drive the signal in very hard. It's dynamic, it's responding, it's reacting to what's coming in, and what's coming in has to cross that threshold in order for there to be any sort of saturation or distortion occurring. Now with distortion, and here's where we get into the more subjective definitions, we typically think of distortion as something that happens at the production stage. So you have a very clean sounding electric guitar, you run it through a stomp box, you run it through an amplifier, it comes out the speaker cabinet, and its tone and its timbre is totally different thanks to some very heavy overdriving and therefore we hear some really obvious distortion and typically that's all the way across the board then. So for example, when you use the grind machine, that would be an example of distortion in the production stage. You probably aren't going to use the grind machine during the mix unless you're taking a sound and radically altering it, which is okay, but that wouldn't be the normal. With saturation and excitation, we tend to think of these processes as being a little more subtle. So a better way of wording this is saturation and excitation do not radically alter the timbre or tonality of a signal. If you're trusting the artist's judgment, you only want to enhance the sounds they give you, not radically alter them. So if you have a piano, even if you then go and apply some form of saturation, it still will sound like a piano after the fact. And it will sound very close to the original as compared to a distortion where it's completely altered. You may not even know that that was a piano to begin with. And again, there's like, you know, a fine line here where these two concepts could kind of cross over. That's totally okay. I just want to kind of make this a little easier for us all to conceptualize. So distortion in production. And these are all different examples of when you might use distortion during production. A form of tonal shaping that adds a lot of harmonics, like overdriving an amplifier, for the sake of getting a more aggressive or edgy sound, like we just talked about with the guitar. If we use digital distortion, this would be an extreme and, in many cases, random timbral shift. So if you're using a bit crusher, and people like the way this sounds, and they use it all the time in production. It just has a particular sonic quality that, for certain styles of music, works really well. But remember that instead of it being harmonic, as in following the harmonic series, where it could have completely random partials popping up all over the place, that's what leads to that more harsh Really, there's no other way of describing it as like a bit crush sound. And you all know the sound. You've all heard it before. Uh, another form of distortion in production would be making a sound just completely unnatural. So disguising whatever the original source was. So I knew somebody, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to take a sample from a Justin Bieber song for every song that they were making, every production they were doing, and they would hide it in their own mix in some way, sometimes by stretching or repitching it in an extreme way, sometimes by bit crushing it, by adding other forms of distortion, by doing, you know, flanging and phasing, all sorts of crazy things. But that's an example of distortion in production. You're taking an original sound and you're hiding it and you're masking it in such a way where you can't tell it's the original. And so the two processors that we've mostly been focused on here would be the grind machine and the bug X when we really push the bug X very hard. Okay, that would be distortion in production. And then also when you repitch or you really stretch something, a lot of times you get artifacts that come along with that. Those would be defined and considered as something like a distortion characteristic. But in production, you know, you're more likely to radically change a sample around as compared to in a mix. You're probably not going to be repitching or restretching anything too extreme unless there's just a gap or a hole missing in that mix. 
So this is an example, okay? This is an image that I'm sure many of you have seen before. Edgar Degas, the rehearsal of the ballet on stage from 1874. This is the original. This would be an example of distorting it. Okay, you can still in some way see some of the form. So if you look to the front of the image, the, the ballerina who's closest to us, as well as the conductor, you can see those two things still apparent here. But unless I told you that this came from this, you'd probably have no idea. In fact, I know you would have no idea. It'd be very difficult to tell. All right, so this would be more an example of distortion. There's some semblance of the original, but it's really been shifted. It's really been changed around. And uh, I just thought that this would be a good visual representation of what we're talking about when we normally refer to distortion. Also, with more of an audio example, here's just your basic electric guitar. You run that guitar through a stomp box. You run it through a cabinet. You run it through an amplifier, okay? And then that is going to lead to your final sound, which is going to be very different from that original guitar. That's the idea with distortion in production. Now let's move on and talk about saturation in the mix, okay? It's the same principle as in you are going to be overdriving an amplifier normally, only now the effect is meant as an enhancement and the original sound source should still be recognizable and present. And here is where the results are judged in context. Okay, so we always come back to that idea of, with production of focusing on that sound on its own in the mix, listening back to everything together. So making sure that enhancement is not only enhancing the sound, but is working well with the rest of the mix. So subtle bits of the same saturator, for example, running through a tape machine or going through just a console can be used as a means to glue a mix. So a form of cohesion. And this is where we're using the TDR slick EQ as our blend EQ with maybe a little bit of that saturation applied to it. It's not going to radically alter the tone or the timbre of the sound, but little bits on every single uh, part in the mix will probably work really well as some kind of a cohesive factor so that it does sound like all of your signals have gone through the same console. That's really the idea there. Same thing if you had a tape machine. With the Bugex, if we go and have a mono source and just put very subtle drive, we could use that as a saturation um, plugin as well. The IVGI, which we're going to look at, the La Petite Excite, which we're going to look at, and then also the PTEQX. As we saw, we could overdrive that tube amplifier and thus get some form of harmonic distortion. It's not going to be anything extreme, but it will be subtle and it will still be changing fundamentally. It will be compressing that signal that's coming in and adding some additional harmonics to it. In the case of the PTEQX, we're talking even ordered harmonics. So here's an example that's going to look somewhat drastic, but I think is going to illustrate this point pretty well. Same image. Here it is, saturated. Okay, so pretty extreme, right? But at the same time, it's still the same image. You can tell what it is. It's just the color's been kind of enhanced. Things have been popped out uh, kind of almost in a hyper real sort of way. But that's a lot of the way people do use saturation and excitation in a mix. So like this is one guitar of maybe a little bit more of a dull tone. You go through the saturation, the excitation, bang, you really make it pop. But this is also why you need to be kind of careful with it because if everything is oversaturated, it loses the impact, it loses the effect. And here are a couple of real world examples. So we have, for example, the console here and then a tape machine that could work as a form of saturation. So here are the image sources. And after you've looked at this slide for a few seconds, we're going to jump into the DAW and uh, go through our examples and the saturators that you are going to have access to for your mix. Now that we've gotten some of the generalities out of the way with the presentation, let's go in and talk about and look at specifics. So the first specific, which is kind of a review, is talking about our blend EQ. So when we have our blend EQ, we want very consistent settings across the board. And now specifically, we'll look at the saturation settings. So you want to make sure, first and foremost, that you're going to be using the same um, basic, you know, setting here, either American, British, German, Soviet, whatever. German probably isn't one that you want to go with here. It's a little bit more like technical, but you could use it. I'm going to go ahead and use American here. 
and uh, I'm just going to play this back. And if we go in here and look at the span, we can first of all see that nothing is really happening here, but let's turn on the saturation and let's go through the different stages. Okay, so with deep and with funky, we can see that something is being brought in here. This is our saturation. It's really subtle. The reason I'm showing you this on a sine wave is because you'll easily be able to hear it. Okay, but if we were to go to a different setting, for example, like if we were to go to linear, we really would have to calibrate this in, drive it pretty hard, and then also apply some gain at 300 to actually see something. And that's why going with linear at 6 dB will be a very, very subtle bit of saturation, something that I would say might be appropriate for like pop music. But if you were going into more like rock and roll, or even some of the more grungy, distorted types of hip hop, I might might go with like a deep version, a deep setting, and then even push this calibration up a little bit higher. Let's say to like 9 dB or so. And now for every time I applied this EQ, I'd probably save this as a preset, or I could just easily copy and paste this default instance to every single track or to all the tracks that need blend EQ. And just like that, I get that little bit of cohesion and that's thanks to the saturation there. Now this is a unique processor because of how it applies it. It's because we go over here to the calibration, we set that, we drive it as much as we want, boom, we get that saturation saturation that works as a cohesion cohesion force like a gluing force so to speak but that's different from what we have with the um, PTEQX okay and this is the way that most of the analog style emulation plugins work which is with an input and an output control so input drive and then output kind of to make that up so if I just go ahead and put the mono routing on we can turn off all of the EQ bands here because all we're focused in right now is the tube. And if we play this back, just so I can hopefully get a nice view on this, we can go in here and we can start to overdrive this. I'll just put the output all the way down first. And now drive it in. Okay, and let's add some additional gain. put the oversampling on. Okay, cool. I'm pushing right on that edge, but now we can finally start to see those harmonics being brought in. If I decrease this a little bit more, you'll see some more detail. And then I could go through the different models. And we can see all the harmonics being brought in like so. Again, on a sine wave, this isn't the best practical example. You're going to be doing this with an actual signal. But a lot of times people put on these analog style EQs not realizing that they do kind of have to push the input gain a little bit if they actually want to hear that character. Otherwise, you're just playing in the bounds like we talked about in the presentation. You're not going over what that amplifier is capable of handling, and therefore, you're not going to get any additional saturation. Specifically with an EQ like this, which is a passive EQ, in theory, if we're boosting and attenuating any of these bands, we're not going to get any additional built-in saturation because there's no amplifier there's no amplifier attached to each individual band like what we have with the slick EQ, which is more transistor based. Transistor is so much smaller than tubes. You can put that on every single band. And when you then add gain in, you're going to be adding additional saturation just based on that EQ characteristic. Okay, so those are the first two examples. Let's move on now to the plugins that we have access to here, and we'll kick it off with the IVGI. Okay, this is going to be very obvious to see and to hear. This is a dedicated saturator. And right off the bat, we have this um, little VU meter that we can see. And if I play the sine wave in like so, you can see that we're already pushing it pretty hard in. And once we start going over that zero mark here on the VU, we will start to hear and apply some saturation. So I'm just going to bring the trim back to right around the zero mark to start. 
okay? That's kind of where you want it. Whenever you're using any kind of analog style plugin and you're gain staging, what we've talked about so many times, you wanna look at that meter and you wanna make sure that you're getting it right around the zero mark, maybe even around minus one. Once we start to go over, that's when the added saturation, the additional harmonics are gonna be brought in. Okay, so let's go ahead here, bring back in the span. And we'll just start to drive this thing. This is like overdriving an amplifier, but just not as extreme. Now notice what's happening here with our output. We are compressing this down. We are peak limiting this down, and therefore it's actually quieter coming out despite adding in the additional harmonics. Now we can actually bias this to one side or the other. If we want more high frequency, or we want to emphasize the low frequency, this isn't the best example of that. If I bring up the volume, maybe we'll be able to hear this a little bit better. We'll have to use a full range signal to really hear what's going on there. This is an example where the sine wave isn't helping us that much. But in theory, if we were to boost this up towards high frequency, you're going to hear more high frequencies coming through and the low frequencies are going to be suppressed and then vice versa if we push more towards the low end there. And we also have this asymmetry. And what this is going to do, we'll apply this in an actual drum beat or so but with the asymmetry all the way down you're going to hear more of like the characteristics of a compressor so it's going to pump a little bit more all the way up it becomes a lot more subtle okay so it does a better job of calculating that with just this static signal not the best example in the world but you can see how those harmonics are being added in which is what i wanted you to see so let's apply this to for example this drum beat here okay so let's solo this out just remove this instance, bring it back on, and we're going to listen this time to what sort of a result we can get. So let's play it back. And right now this is gain staged basically perfectly. That's what I'd wanna see. All right, so let's drive it in pretty hard. So you can hear that in this example, this becomes almost more like a distortion and less of a saturation, but this will help us to hear what's going on with this response in ASIM. So listen to the kick drum in relation to the snare here. And now listen to what happens when I throw it to the other side. You hear how everything else is actually being brought up a little bit closer. All right, compare that again. Listen to those hats. And now listen to the hats. Okay, so we can also mess around with the response. Hear how the low frequencies are being pushed more or the high frequencies. Okay, so that's the general idea. And here, for example, I would not push the drive up to a point of really audibly hearing that distortion. That was just for the sake of example. This is where it becomes more of a saturator and less of a distortion. So I can add a lot more excitement to the high end there. Check it out here off. Okay, so here we're at minus 5.2. And here we're at minus 6. So we have added a little bit of uh, additional gain there. But let's say I want to emphasize the low end a little bit more. Now we're quieter.
Okay, so there you go. One other example we could look at that is going to actually really allow you to hear this a lot better and more in the classic like peak limiter style saturator is with this clap. Okay, so I'm going to bring it on here. We're going to turn it off to start and we'll just listen to it first and then mess around with it. Bring it out a little bit more. Okay, so we can see the peak here is at minus 3.1. All right, that's pretty peaky for this kind of a signal. So I'm going to use the saturator to actually bring this down, but at the same time, add some additional oomph to it, okay, for lack of a better term. So let's just mess around with this a little bit. And one thing you'll notice is because this is a VU meter, it actually responds to the peaks a lot more slowly. So while we're really at minus three here, and we should be seeing this actually in the zero range, it's not making it up that high. So that's okay. VU meter is a lot slower than peak meter, so I'm not going to mess with the trim in this example. But after I bring everything a little bit closer together, clamp down on that peak a little bit, I think you'll start to see and uh, understand the power of this effect. So we can hear the clamp down. And now let's check what are we peaking out at. Minus 5.7. What about now? Minus 11. Okay, so now if we listen to the before and after, we're going to hear a huge difference. Let's try to bring this back to around minus three. Okay, that should be close enough. Okay, without. And then with. And this is why saturators like this are used so frequently. It adds a lot of oomph. It adds a lot of power to the sound without completely transforming it and changing it like what you might get if we were to, uh, for example, bring on the grind machine onto this sound. It would have a completely different characteristic and tonal shaping. But again, what we're really doing is bringing down the peak of this sound. So if we bounce it, we can look at the difference. And this is how you'll see that this is very much compression. Okay, if we zoom right in here, here's the original, and then here is the alternate version, which has really been clamped down hard, as you can see, and it's really pushing down there. Uh, very interesting. I wasn't expecting it to see that come out, but I still like the sound, and that's what it's really all about. Now we're going to look at this Exciter plugin. And this is where all of our definitions and things kind of go out the window. And it's also the reason why I didn't attempt to define the exciter in any way, shape, or form. And that's because every exciter is very different. If you look up the Sonics Inflator, for example, that has some kind of secret formula that they will not release to the public. It's same with like the Amphex. Uh, oral exciter. Maybe eventually they did release the schematic for that, but for the longest time they claimed it was like some super secret formula that nobody could know about. And that's still kind of true to this day with exciters that come out. But typically when I think of an exciter, I'm thinking it's going to ex excite new overtones, new harmonics. And really with an exciter, the way that you would maybe differentiate it from a saturator is that the exciter is really specific to the harmonics that it adds in and the harmonics that it emphasizes. It more so is emphasizing harmonics and overtones that are already there as compared to adding a bunch of new ones. But at the same time, you typically do expect it to add some new ones, usually in the form of what's referred to as harmonic synthesis. So it can come off really clear. It really just makes everything more exciting um, without actually adding loudness. So you can actually bring down the output, put the exciter on there, and it sounds brighter. It sounds more present. Just like with the saturator, you have to be 
insanely careful about how much you use this because you'll have the tendency and you'll feel like you want to use it everywhere. But again, at the beginning, determine your really important parts. And that is what I would say is where it's appropriate to use the exciter. Just make them that even little bit more shiny, make them that little bit more exciting, but don't apply it to everything. But let's look at this exciter here real quick on this sine wave. And what you'll notice is as we drive in the low, and I need to go in here and change the range. As I go in here and drive the low, you're gonna see that no new harmonics are brought in. Nothing. If I drive the high, nothing. No new harmonics are brought in. So this actually is working more like a dynamic EQ where you just have two bands, what do you want to emphasize more? Do you want to emphasize the low and this will react dynamically? Or do you want to emphasize the highs when they come in? That's all this is really doing. It's a dynamic EQ in the form of an exciter, just an easy to use dynamic EQ. Now noise floor is kind of interesting. That brings in some like white noise at the very top, might be useful for percussion. It's not even something that you're gonna hear but we can see it if we go to a range so far below human hearing where you're actually just gonna see like errors in the signal. But you will see the difference with this turned off and on. Okay, again, remember that all of these additional little spikes that you're seeing well below the range of human hearing. We're not actually hearing any of those brought in. This is kind of like the whole aliasing debate. I'm not gonna get into that in this course, but I just want you to see what that does. So let's apply this, and this works so much better in application than it does in just uh, looking at it with a sine wave. But let's run it through this drum beat and hear what sort of sound we can get. Get rid of that. So this would be an example where I feel like this is really bright. So I want to add in more of that low end and we can look at this again through the span that will be useful. So you see how it's driving that up more? And again, a little bit goes a long way here. And then we can also apply some to the highs. Now the CV control is just going to try to smooth out what you've just done there on the high end. So in this example, I'm gonna bring that in a lot to try to get a better balance. Okay, let's listen to that before and after. So in this example, actually, I'd be more likely to use an EQ than I would this exciter because the problem in changing the balance is listen to what happens to the snare. The snare really gets lost. So this exciter probably wouldn't work that well on this particular drum loop, but let's try it on this kick drum down here. Let's see how this is gonna work. This would be an example where I definitely wanna add some highs to this kick to make sure that it cuts through on the smaller speakers. That took embarrassingly longer than it should have. Okay, so let's add some highs into this. Again, a little bit goes a long way as you can tell. Okay, so we don't really lose any of that punch or power down there in the subs or low end, but we do kick up a little bit what's happening here with the higher frequencies. So this would be a great application of this particular exciter, especially if you felt like your kick drum just doesn't have as much power in the top end that it really needs if you're going to have it kind of stick out, kind of poke through on all different forms of uh, playback systems. So if somebody doesn't have a subwoofer, for example, you need to emphasize those highs a little bit more. And again, if we want to go extreme with it, we can then try to balance it.
Let's try putting on this noise floor, see if we hear any difference. Probably won't. Maybe a little bit more clarity up there. I don't know. I think it might be placebo, but I'm sure some of you with a lot better ears than me will be able to hear a difference when you bring that on or off. I kind of like it on, but I think that's just because I want an application for it to be turned on. So again, this is all about context. This is all about listening to these in relation to other parts going on in the mix and really choose your spots wisely and carefully. Too much of anything and it's just too much. It doesn't do you any good, right? Like I love chocolate ice cream, but if I ate chocolate ice cream every day, probably in a couple months, I'd be totally sick of it. It's the same kind of idea with saturators and with exciters. You need to choose your spots carefully. Too much will actually hurt you more than it will probably help you, uh, or I should say will hurt your mix as compared to help your mix. I don't think it will do anything to you as a person, but you never know. That's why you need to be careful with these. All right, so that's the idea with the saturators and the exciters. So so again, choose your spots carefully. Remember that it's actually also acting as a dynamic control. It's bringing down some of those peaks. So if you need to, again, get a little bit more room, be able to maximize that loudness, this isn't a new concept. Uh, people have been doing this for a long time. And again, that's one of those added benefits of like a console or having a tape machine uh, that in the digital domain, people didn't really realize just how useful that was. But now with these saturators and exciters, you can emulate the same kind of effect.